wanting to invest in real estate, you know that there's a lot of confusion about which strategies actually work and which ones don't. But don't worry because this video is gonna clear all of that up. When I first started learning about real estate, I was definitely overwhelmed by the sheer number of strategies and all of the gurus who were telling me that their strategy was the best. Then I watched a video that said something like, the best strategy is the one you choose and stick with. And while it's obviously not quite that simple, I do think there's some merit to the idea. Because running around like a chicken with your head cut off, chasing one strategy this week and another one next week, means that you'll never actually lock in and be successful at one of them. I don't want that to happen to you guys, and so this video is going in depth on 10 different strategies, and hopefully it will help you determine which one you should get laser focused on. By the way, my name is Lily. If you're new here, uh, the best way to support the channel is to turn that like button blue or subscribe if you haven't already. And with that said, let's get started. We're going to break our 10 investment strategies down between five tiers. The first one is easy entry point. Second, it takes hustle. Third, we've got if you've got the money, go for it. Fourth is low risk, low return. And fifth is high risk, high return. With that said, let's head to the whiteboard and start breaking these down. We're gonna take a look at 10 different investing strategies and in order to compare them, we're gonna use the same example property. So when we evaluate these deals, we're gonna talk about a $200,000 house at a 4% interest rate on a 30 year loan. We're also gonna assume that the property taxes are gonna be about $2,000 and the home insurance is gonna be about $1,000 and that we can rent this property out for $2,000 a month. These numbers may be lower or higher where you live, but I think it's a good idea for us to have a baseline, work with the same numbers from strategy to strategy so we can really get an honest comparison. The reason that I'm using $2,000 for rent for this $200,000 property is because of something called the 1% rule, which basically says that if your rent is 1% of your purchase price, you have a high likelihood of that being a good cash flowing deal. If you want to figure out what the rental amounts are in your area for a particular property, you can check out the website called Rentometer. I've got a link to it in the description. It's really easy to use. All you have to do is put in the address of the property you want to evaluate, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, and it will do a search and figure out what the average rent for that property is in your area. We're gonna start off with comparing the traditional strategy of just a buy and hold rental property with the all cash purchase. If you're purchasing a property as an investment, you're usually gonna to have to put down 20% as your down payment. And for a $200,000 house, that will be 40K. If you're purchasing a property all cash, that means you're putting down 100% as the down payment and you would therefore need 200K. Now, whether you have this amount of money in the bank or not, it's a good idea to understand the ins and outs of each of these strategies. So stick with me. Remember, we're assuming that this house can rent out for $2,000. And so that's gonna be the same between both of these. But here's the first big difference. When you put down 20%, that means that you're taking out a loan for 80%. And with our assumptions about the interest rate, the home insurance, property taxes, this payment is going to be around $1,000 and $13 a month. But if you're putting down 100%, that means you don't have any loans. All you have to pay is your property taxes and your insurance and our estimates would say that that's gonna be about $250 a month. So that's a huge difference. That means that this property here, you're gonna have $987, whereas the all cash rental is gonna be able to keep 1750. Something that we have to remember is you should always be setting aside extra money every single month. And so for both of these properties, we're gonna set aside $400. That means this traditional rental is gonna cash flow $587 a month, while this all cash rental is going to cash flow $1,350 a month. That's a really big difference. But while it may look like the all cash rental is obviously winning, there is one really, really big thing that we have to consider between these two strategies, and that's the return on investment. You calculate that by taking your monthly cash flow and multiplying it by 12. So for this property, you would get $7,000 $44 a year and when you do the same thing over here multiply this 1350 by 12 you're gonna get $16,200 a year to calculate your return you're gonna divide that by the amount of money that you put in your initial investment and I understand there's gonna be closing costs and all over the types of fees but for simplicity's sake we're gonna say this one you put in 40k and this property you put in the full 200k now Here's where things get really, really interesting because the return on investment for this traditional rental property is 17.6%. And for the all cash purchase, it's only 8.1%. And to take it even a step further, when you reverse this math, so when you take the 40K that you put in and divide it by your monthly amount, that tells you how long it's gonna take for you to get your money back. And so in order to make that 40K back on this property, it would take 5.7 years. 
When you do the same thing and d take this 200K, divide it by how much you make a year, you discover that it's going to take 12.3 years. And so these are the two most important numbers I would look at if I was trying to decide, should I put 20% down and have a mortgage payment or should I put all cash down on this property, have no mortgage payment and only pay my property taxes and my insurance every month? These are the things that make the difference. And think about this, with that $200,000, you can buy one all cash property or you can buy five traditional rental properties and put 20% down each. That way you're gonna get a much higher return on your money. And for those reasons, I put the traditional buy and hold strategy in the if you've got the money category. Meaning if you've got 20% to put down on a property, that's gonna get you a pretty good return on your money. On the other hand, I put the all cash strategy in the low risk, low return category. If you have the money to purchase a property all cash, it's gonna be pretty low risk because all you have to worry about are your insurance and your property taxes every month. But because you chose that low risk investment rather than taking on debt, it does mean that your return is also going to be lower. Next up, house hacking. Now, what if you don't have the money for either of those strategies to put down 20% or 100% on a rental property? That's where house hacking comes into play. This is how I started my investing journey by house hacking a duplex, and this is how it works. When you're purchasing a property, one to four units that you plan to live in, you don't have to put down 20%. You can put down 3.5% because you plan to live there. So rather than putting 40K down on a $200,000 house, you would only have to put 7K down. But the thing about house hacking though is that you've gotta be willing to share your space. So let's imagine this is a single family, three bedroom, two bathroom house. You're gonna live in one room and if the whole house would rent out for $2,000, let's imagine that you can rent those rooms out for $750 each. 750 times two means that you're bringing in $1,500 a month in rent and your monthly mortgage payment would be around $1,340. And you can see it's much higher on the house hack than it was in the traditional rental because you only put down 3.5%. The higher your down payment is, the less money you need to borrow from the bank and therefore the lower your monthly payment will be. So with this house hack, you'll profit $160 a month, but remember we always wanna take out money for things like repairs, vacancy, you never know what costs are gonna come up that you're gonna to have to take care of as the homeowner. And so this property actually has what I call a house hacker's return. Every month, you're gonna to have to pay yourself $240 to live there. Now, I don't know where you live, but I don't know of anywhere you can live for $240 a month while owning an asset that is increasing in value. Plus, an underappreciated value of house hacking is that you only have to live there for one year. And so let's imagine you pay $240 for a year to live there, and one year later, you decide to move out and go ahead and rent out that entire property for $2,000. Now we've got basically the same scenario as over here. We're gonna bring in 2K a month. We still have a slightly higher note. We still owe 1340, which leaves us 660. We take out our 400, and now our property is bringing us $260 a month. When you multiply that by 12, you get 3,000, $120 a year. And remember, you only put 7K into this deal. Therefore, you've got an insane return of 44.6%. And when you flip that math, it lets you know that you're making your money back in 2.6 years, but you gotta remember that you did live there for one year. So I would say 3.6 years back to start making profit and get your $7,000 back. This is the power of house hacking. You put a low down payment, extremely reduce your cost of living, move out one year later, rent out the entire property, and you have an insane return. And that is why house hacking is going into the easy entry point category. But the thing is, you can only house hack one property per year, so maybe you've already done this, or you're already living where you wanna be. Another strategy for you might be burr investing. Burr is an acronym, and this strategy changes the traditional way that you might buy a property. It stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. It can get a little complicated, but we're gonna do our best to simplify these numbers, so just stick with me. When you're looking to do the Burr strategy, you're searching for a property that's not really in livable condition. Traditional buyers aren't interested in this property and most banks won't loan on it because it needs a lot of work. Because of that, the first step in using this property is getting a loan. And oftentimes it's gonna be something called a hard money loan. So you're not going to the bank to get a 30 year mortgage, but instead you're going to a hard money lender who will give you the money you need, but it's usually for a term of 12 to 
to 18 months and at a much higher interest rate. There are a lot of different ways to qualify for these loans, but when I was doing my research to get started with the Burr strategy, I was told, among other things, that I needed to have 50K in liquid assets, meaning cash, stocks, bonds, things of that nature. So that is a hurdle, but if you can qualify for a Burr loan either by yourself or with a partner, here's how it would work. That same property, if it was nice and fixed up, would be $200,000, but because it's not, we're gonna say that you can get it for 110K. And we'll estimate that in order to get it fixed up, you're gonna need about 30K. And so while the ARV, or what's called the after repair value, is 200K, but in order to get it there, you're gonna to need to spend 140K to purchase it and fix it up. I also found in my research that this particular company was willing to give me 90% of the money I needed for this property. And so in this example, they would loan me 126K and I would need to come up with a down payment for the rest of 14K. That 126 plus the 14 will get me to the 140 I need to purchase and fix up this property. There are two main differences when you're using a hard money loan versus a traditional mortgage, and that comes in the interest rate and the way that you pay it back. On our house hack, we estimated that we got about a 4% interest rate, but hard money loans, the interest rates are much higher, oftentimes upwards of 10%. The second difference is that with a traditional mortgage, we pay the same amount every single month for 30 years or until we sell the property. But with a hard money loan, we have a period of 12 to 18 months where you're only paying interest. And then when that period is up, you pay back the entire loan amount. And so for this loan, that might be around $1,200 a month in your interest only payments. And when we add in the property taxes and insurance that we're gonna have to pay as well, we're gonna be looking at about $1,550 a month. So then it's time to get to work. Use that $30,000 to start fixing up this home and rehabbing it. And once it's all nice and pretty, you can now rent it out, just like the other ones, for $2,000. When you take out your $1,550, and we'll still say that you can take out $400 a month, but one of the great things about burying a property is you know you just fixed everything up in that home. And so you're less likely to need that $400 a month for repairs. So you might be able to lower that number, but for the purposes of our example, we'll just say you're gonna be super safe. You're still gonna take out $400 a month and that's gonna leave you with just $50. All right, that does not seem like a good return at all. But remember, you've only got this loan for 12 to 18 months and then you've gotta pay it back. This is when the buy, rehab, rent, refinance part of the Burr strategy comes into play. It all hinges on you doing what is called a cash out refinance. When you do a cash out refinance, the bank will look at the property you own and determine how much it's worth. And remember, we said that this property had an after repair value of $200,000. They will then give you up to 70% of that value in cash. What's 70% of $200,000? That's gonna equal $100,000. And 40k so once you get that 140k back from the cash out refinance you can pay back the 126 that you owe to the hard money lender and you can pay back that 14k down payment either to yourself or to a partner that you loaned it from but either way you've gotten back all of the money that you use to purchase and rehab this property now this is pretty much the same as the traditional rental example right you've got a two hundred thousand dollar house four percent interest rate 30-year loan that's gonna rent for two thousand dollars you're gonna have a payment of about 1013 after you take out your $400 per month. That's gonna leave you with the same 587 a month or 744 a year. But here's the kicker. You don't have any money left in this deal, right? We would normally divide this number by the amount that you put in. But remember, you got a loan for this property, took all the money that you put in got it back out with the cash out refinance, and you've got $0 left in the deal, you can't divide by zero, and so that is an infinite return. Now you can go back and show your partners, I got a loan for $140,000, I purchased the property, I fixed it up, I got all of that money back, let's go ahead and do that last R, repeat it. This is not a simple strategy, and for that reason, it's going into the it takes hustle category. You've gotta be able to convince a hard money lender to lend you this money, find a property that it will work with, correctly estimate the after repair value, go through the process of getting the cash out refinance. But if you can pull all of that off, you'll be making some crazy returns on your investment. All of the strategies that we've talked about so far have needed at least a little bit of money. But there is a way that you can get started in real estate for zero dollars and that's called wholesaling. 
lot of different ways to wholesale, but the concept is simple. You're going to find a property that for some reason needs to be sold below market value. Those reasons could be that the property is abandoned, that there's some type of damage that the owners can't pay to fix, or that the owners are behind on payments and the property is about to be foreclosed on. Whatever it is, there's some type of problem that the owner is running into that they cannot use the traditional means to sell their home. For our purposes, let's imagine that the property has been completely abandoned and no one has lived there for years. It's pretty much just a wreck. Because of that, you're going to talk with the owner and figure out what they would be willing to sell it for. Now, again, if it was in perfect condition, it might sell for $200,000. But let's imagine that the property owner is willing to get rid of it for one hundred and fifty. dollars You don't have one hundred and fifty dollars but that's all right. You're going to get the property under contract and set to close in 30 days. In that 30 days, it's up to you to find an investor that does have 150K and wants to purchase this property, usually so they can do something like the bird strategy with it. In the meantime, there might be things that you have to do to this property. It might be all overgrown because it's been abandoned, so you've got to mow the lawn, take care of the landscaping. There may be furniture and all other types of things inside the house that were just left there, so you may have to clean those out. That's between you and the owner and you and the investor that you're going to pass this property along to, but you're basically going in between the two to figure out what needs to be done to sell this property for the work that you do you're going to charge the investor what is called an assignment fee and let's just imagine you charge them ten thousand dollars so the owner gets 150k you get 10k and the investor purchases the property for 160k so basically you are the middleman between the owner and the investor in this deal doing whatever work needed to be done to make it happen and for that work you got an assignment fee you may not need money to wholesale, but I'm going to put it in the it takes hustle category because it does take a lot of work for you to find property owners, figure out what they're willing to sell their property for, find investors and get everybody to be OK with your assignment fee in the middle. Our next investment strategy is something that we've all seen on HGTV, fix and flipping. Now, similar to some of our other strategies, when you're looking to fix and flip, you're not looking for the nicest, prettiest house on the block. You're actually probably looking for the worst house that you can find. This house is so bad that there's no way anyone could live in it and there's no way a bank would give you a loan for it. So you're either going to have to get a hard money loan or possibly have the money between yourself and your partners. Let's imagine that this house, which could be worth $200,000, is in such bad state that you can get it for 75 k but it's gonna take a lot to fix up, and so you're gonna need another 50K in order to rehab it. That's your purchase. This means you need $125,000 in cash or in the form of a hard money loan in order to make this work. But once it's all said and done, this house is fixed up, you're not gonna rent it out, you're then gonna sell it for the full $200,000. Depending how quickly you can fix up this property and get it sold, that could be a pretty quick $75,000 profit, but there are two big downsides to fixing and flipping. The first is that there's high risk on depending that this home will sell for $200,000. You never know when the market is going to crash and when housing prices are going to tank. And if you get caught during one of those downturns, you could spend $125,000 to fix up this property, but then possibly not even be able to sell it for that much, depending on how much the market goes down. The second big risk for house flipping comes in the form of taxes. When you buy a property, fix it up, and sell it like this, you're subject to taxes that can be anywhere from 10 to 37%. So you're not getting that full $75,000 because of that fix and flipping goes in the high risk, high return category. But there is another lower risk way to flip a house and it's called the live in flip. This strategy is where you find a house that isn't really the nicest, but it's definitely in livable condition. Maybe it's just really outdated with like paint and cabinets from the eighties or something like that, but you can definitely live there. And while you live there, you're going to flip the house. This strategy works best for people who are willing to DIY and do a lot of the work themselves rather than paying for contractors. So if we imagine that house that would be worth $200,000 if it was fixed up and nice, but it's really outdated. So let's say you pick it up for 150. If you plan on living there, you can put 3.5% down, which is going to be just $5,250. That would put your monthly payment at around $1,065. That's your PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance. And we'll say that over the next two years while you live there, you're going to spend $20,000 to fix it up. Once you've made it nice and beautiful, you're going to go to sell it. But because it's been two years, hopefully the property has appreciated from that $200,000 it is now worth 225 k So when you sell it, you've got to pay back the loan that you got for 150 k to purchase it, as well as recoup the money you used to rehab it and your down payment, which would leave you to profit 
about $49,750. While there is the same risk as fix and flipping that the property won't appreciate, that risk is mitigated because you live in the house. You fix it up yourself, you're comfortable there. If the market crashes, you don't have to sell. You can just stay where you are and continue making your monthly payment. But if the market does go up, that's the time when you can sell and collect this money. The other really big benefit that's different from fix and flipping is that when you live in a house for two of the last five years, you do not have to pay capital gains taxes. If you're a single person and you sell that house for anything less than 250, and if you're a couple and you sell the house for anything less than 500, all of the profit is yours. You don't have to pay taxes on it. Because of that, we're putting live in flips in the easy entry point category. Next up, we've got another strategy that is great if you're not swimming in cash. There are a lot of ways to invest in mobile homes, including buying entire mobile home parks. But for this video, we're going to talk about buying individual mobile homes. I recently watched an interview on the Trailer Cash Academy YouTube page of this woman named Holly. Holly was looking to purchase her first mobile home, fix it up, and basically flip it. After doing her research, she was able to find a man who was looking to get rid of an old mobile home that he had. It was not in the best shape, and he was behind on the lot rent by $775. While Holly was talking with him, he told her that if she took the mobile home off of his hands, paid the lot rent, and he could just be done with it, he would give it to her for free. And so obviously Holly said yes. She paid $775 to the mobile home park so that the mobile home could stay where it was. And then she paid about another $200 in materials and fixed up the mobile home as well as she could herself. Once those things were taken care of, she started advertising the home for sale and was able to sell it for $5,000. So Holly made just over $4,025 by solving a problem for the owner, paying the lot rent, taking it off his hands, and then going ahead, doing what she could, purchasing the materials for just $200, fixing it up as well as she could herself, and then putting it on the market. While it did take a little bit of work, that is a nice return and it goes into the it takes hustle category. Next up, we're gonna look at two related strategies, furnishing your long-term rentals or using them for short-term like on Airbnb. Let's think back to our house hacking example where we were renting out two bedrooms in our house for $750 each. Now let's imagine that you furnish those rooms with beds and other furniture, everything that somebody would need to live there, they may be willing to pay more. And so let's say you can rent out both of those rooms for $850 each. That would mean you're bringing in $1,700. And in that house hacking example, we said that our monthly payment was around $1,340. That means we make $360 a month before we take out our 400 for vacancy and repairs, and therefore we're coming out of pocket every month $40. Now remember, when we didn't have those rooms furnished, we were coming out of pocket every month $240. And regardless what the numbers are on your own deal, maybe investing in some furniture up front in order to get a higher rental rate would make it so that you have to come out of pocket less or even can break even and get some cash flow. So while it does cost a little more to invest in the furniture as well as a down payment to get the property, I think this is still a really good strategy and it's gonna go in the it takes hustle category. Now let's talk about Airbnb arbitrage. This is a kind of controversial strategy that some people have done really, really well with or some people have done really, really, really badly with. The idea is that you don't need to actually go out and buy a property in order to do this. You look for local properties that are already for rent, call up the landlord and ask if you can furnish the property and put it on Airbnb. You tell them that you'll pay whatever they're asking for rent and you'll take care of all of the Airbnb guests, repair any damages, etc. It may sound pretty far-fetched, but I spent an entire afternoon calling up landlords and seeing what they would think about this, and about 50% of them said yes. The idea is that while they might be charging $2,000 in rent, we know that Airbnb, when it goes well, can be pretty profitable. So let's imagine you could make $4,000 a month on Airbnb. You're still gonna have to pay the utilities, and it's probably a good idea to still set aside money in case you have to fix anything, so we'll do that same $400. At the end of the day, you could be taking home upwards of like $1,600 in this example. But obviously there's a big issue of not making enough money to cover the rent and the utility payments. If that happens, you could be coming out of pocket to pay that rent. And in the recent months, there have been a ton of stories of people who were doing this with upwards of 50, 60, 70 properties, just lost it all and owed landlords a ton of money. And so like with any of these strategies, I'm not telling you whether you should or shouldn't do it. I'm just breaking down the numbers, but Airbnb arbitrage is definitely going in the high risk, high return category. 
So those were nine of our strategies and they all involve to some extent being hands on with a physical property. But the 10th one I want to give you guys the option for is something that is really hands off. And these are real estate investment trusts or syndications. These two are similar to each other because they both involve a large group of investors who buy in in order to purchase properties that none of them would be able to buy on their own. We're talking hundreds of thousands, multi-million dollar properties. And when you pay in, these almost behave like stocks where you then own a certain percentage of the real estate that the company itself owns. The terms between these trusts and syndications differ, so make sure you read them closely. But basically at the end of the year, they're gonna pay you a certain percentage of the cash flow based on the percentage that you put into the deals. Just like investing in the stock market, investing in real estate trusts or syndications are super, super hands off. You're not gonna have day to day involvement with the decisions that are made in the property and you pretty much sit back, hope that your asset raises in value and collect the dividend that you get at the end of the year. And just like the stock market, the value of the real estate in the trust or the syndication could go up over time or go down. Although from 1975 to 2014, real estate trusts returned around 14%, while the S&P 500 returned about 12.5%. Because it's so hands off and really depends on how the housing market does as a whole, we're putting this one in the low risk, low return category. I've done other videos that go in depth into some of the strategies we've talked about today. And if you wanna check them out, you can find them in this playlist right here. I post videos most Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. And until next time, thanks for watching.